Hello, you've reached Gloria with Farmstead Talk, and I am here today with Kelly with the Daydreamers Homestead, and she's representing her state of Virginia in this homesteading interview today. Welcome, Kelly, and thank you for joining me. Hi, Gloria, and thank you for having me. No problem. It's a pleasure. So would you like to share with the audience where they can find you on social media? Yeah, actually, I am just on Instagram at the.daydreamers.homestead. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So if you would tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're currently living, and a little bit about your family. Yeah, sure. So we're in Central Virginia. We're just outside of Lynchburg. Lynchburg is a small but big town at the same token. It grows quite a bit every fall. With a, We have a, pretty much five colleges here in this small little town. Um, but we live on the outskirts about 25 minutes from downtown and we homestead on just under four acres. It is my husband of almost 20 years and our 16 year old son that, are, that is still at home. We do have an older son, but he is on the coop. Oh, okay. Um, so what was your inspiration, this lifestyle? Well, I kinda came, yeah, I kind of came to the realization that all the foods that we were eating were coming from a box and I knew there was a, a better way to do it. I grew up gardening with my dad and I thought, I don't have to live this way anymore. Um, I don't have to feed my family everything from a box. So I kind of started on gardening as an adult away from my dad, who my dad had already passed on. But I got my gardening from him. Uh, he can garden conventionally, you know, he would throw anything on it and it would grow beautifully, but not my principles and not what I wanted to follow as far as feeding my family the best that I could. Um, not to say that he didn't have the same intention, um, but I just kind of want to rekindle how people lived a long time ago, a simpler life. Um, my grandparents did it, you know, and I think it's kind of in my blood. We grew up with gardening and chickens and so it's kind of been, I don't know, in my blood since I was a baby. <laughs> okay. So Kelly, a little bit about the community that you're living in. What does that look like? Is it a large community? Is it a suburban area or is that out in the country? So we're kind of, I would say we are a, um, a rollish area. We're not quite very far out. Everyone around us is, is country. Um, there's cattle farms all around us. Um, we do have some hemp farmers around us now as well, kind of rolling countryside. Um, everybody uh, usually has you know, several acres of where we are in our, in our immediate area. But, you know, we have um, a lot of rolling hills. So there are a lot of um, kind of the foothills of the mountain of uh, central Virginia. Okay. It's a very beautiful place to live. When you say there's hemp farmers out there, is that industrialized hemp or is it like medicinal? No, it is is small local farmers that have decided to take up several of their acres. They may have, you know, formerly used for, you know, cow pasture and they're, you know, maybe doing five to 20 acres here and they are all around us and they're just now breaking into that market. And it was a market that I actually want to get into as well, but I'm finding that the seed prices are astronomical for someone who's just wanting to kind of get into it to learn a little bit about cultivating it. But I mean, is it, do they sell it for the purpose of medicinal uses, like to dispensaries? Oh, yes. Yeah, all of the ones around here are growing for just CBT, uh, excuse me, CBD. They're not growing for um, the, uh, the fibers or the grains. Okay, I see. So what is your growing zone and what's your growing season out there? Yeah, so I'm in 7B and our growing season, well, for me, is actually just started. I started a bunch of seeds <laughs> earlier this week, um, but I'll plant those out probably early March, um, you know, the cold weather crops, and then we get to grow all the way to about middle of October. We had our first frost, I believe it was October 22nd this year, which is about on time for us. Nice. Yeah. And so what kind of gardening styles do you use? Well, I grow everything organically. That's like I said before, it's really important for me not to be adding things into my you know, family's bodies that don't belong there. Um, I, I do grow in the ground. We um, have struggled with um, soil quality at our property and trying to rebuild that. And in doing so, I kind of abandoned the spot that I had originally wanted my garden to be at. So I, I moved it to a different location and I did till that 
you know, and so it's in the ground. No, I do have some raised beds, but I don't utilize them as much as I should. Um, but uh, we do market rows. Um, and I, uh, I've, I'm finding that I like the market rows a lot because I can't intentionally plant and would have been a newly established garden this year and fighting the weeds and the grasses that want to come back in. That really helped a lot. So what is the growing space that you're working with out there? I'm growing on about 1,500 square feet. Um, and it's, uh, like I said, just a newly established uh, spot for last year. So it'd be curious to see what it does this year. I'm hoping to have a lot of high hopes for it this year. I've seen some pictures on your Instagram. It's a lovely yeah. <laughs> it, It's lovely. It looks really nice too. Very Thank healthy. You. Thank you. It was a struggle to get it to look at like anything this year. I dislocated my ankle for the second time um, in early April. So to do anything this year was, was quite hard. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. So what are some of your favorite things to grow out there? What does best in your location? Um, yeah, tomatoes usually always do really well for us. I like to can a lot of tomatoes. Um, but potatoes are my favorite thing to pull out of the garden and, and in 30 minutes just make a meal out of potatoes. They're, they're, I love potatoes. Um, and squash, I love squash, but I grow a little bit of everything. I try to grow something new every year. Uh, this year it's going to be bok choy, so we'll see how that goes. Um, try to get into a little more of the Asian greens and venturing out a little bit here. Um, Good. Um, so what would you say is your biggest challenge then uh, for, for, your, for your garden and growing? So definitely dealing with the soil quality and we struggled for so long to do anything there even after adding hundreds of dollars of you know compost, getting them by the truck load and still trying to do amendments. It was just because when we bought our house it was brand new so the topsoil had all been pushed away and you know ended up somewhere else and I was bound and determined I was going to put it in this one spot but um like I said so having a garden you know this year um that was growing but then had big issues with deer so I didn't end up having to put an electric fence up to keep the deer out and that was you know hit and miss here and there so um but for the most part it saved saved everything so would you say that last year then would be was your first actual growing season oh no no I, I we actually apartment homesteaded for many years before we bought our house so um i gardened there for four summers and just had incredible success you know i was you know kind of be beginning to believe that it was beginner's luck <laughs> that you know oh i can grow all this food sure i can grow us all of our food that we need when we buy our home you know <laughs> this is so easy and then you know bam i get here with the deer that i never had an issue with before there and then not only that just having to struggle with building soul again and and trying to you know having to make a right turn when you were trying to go left but in the end we'll figure it out right so with the soil, and I'm, I'm just curious because I too built a new home and yeah. struggled with the same issues of right. all that topsoil being taken away and bringing yeah. ton loads of, of compost in. Mm -hmm. um, so how many years was it that you, and, that you started working that garden then, bringing the soil uh, to about regenerate to the soil? Yeah, about three years before I just said it's I'm I'm done pouring money into this and time and I'm not yielding any results. So, but I do have I recently purchased some uh, cover crops and I'm going to work a little more intensively, hoping I do have somebody that's willing to give me um, some large uh, old rolls of hay that um, I'm going to go get and hopefully I can get four or five of those and just. Let it set because I really would like to have my garden eventually in that spot in that location because it's just you know it's just the best best area in my property close to the house and close to water source if I have to use my rain barrels or if I have to you know give even more water from the spigot there um, but yeah I I think that you know I spent too long on it um, and then a lot of things that come back to. I didn't pay enough attention to my property. You know, they say 
you know, don't go out and just throw something here, pay attention to your climate, pay attention to your zones, you know, see how your land flows, see what happens and give it time. And I didn't do that. And you know, that, that really bit me. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious too, for myself as <clears throat> trying to figure out exactly how long it's going to take to rebuild the soil with yeah. build sites. Right. Well, I reverted to raised beds. Actually. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's a long process, but right. You know, it's a, but, you're, but you're in the desert too. So you have, even if you, you build a soil, what's to say it's not going to get covered up by the next sandstorm or. Well, and that's yeah. exactly it. You know, with yeah. the, with the high winds that we have, right. You have to keep it covered all the time. So yeah. it's definitely a challenge. Yeah. Um, so what do you do? I know you, you farm organically. What do you do for weed and pest control? So I do a lot of hand picking. <laughs> That's not my favorite thing to do, but I try to catch everything early. Um, if I can, um, I do, um, uh, mulches. Um, I try to do grass clippings and leaves, um, even, uh, bedding from chicken coops that have sat for a while, put that down, which is good because it gives them some fertilizer too. Um, but this year was actually the first year that I've used any uh, landscaping fabric. And I did like that quite a bit. You still, of course, do have, you know, the running grasses that will grow over it and just keep going. So you have to maintain on those. Um, but uh, yeah, weed control, is, especially in a newly established garden, can be tough to do. But uh, you know, I won't say that it was perfect this year or Instagram worthy, but you know, it did produce some food. So that's ideally all that matters. Yeah, it was, it looks beautiful. Thank but you. what do you do for your bugs? Um, I had, yeah, I use row cover. I do a lot of hand picking, especially I have the worst issues with squash bugs. And also uh, Japanese beetles hit us this year pretty good. Um, but I, um, I just spend time out there. It's my favorite place to be. So when I'm out there, you know, why not, you know, roll those squash bug eggs off of the plants and squish them and move on. But um, with the Japanese beetles, I did uh, try a little bit of neem oil for the first time. And I won't say that it worked and I won't say that it didn't work. So it was, you know, in the end, the plant survived and the Japanese beetles either moved or they died. So. Yeah, I have a huge infestation in the summers with Japanese beetles yeah. on my pumpkins and squashes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, too much to too many to hand pick. I take the yeah. I take the water hose and I just spray them very heavily. Sure. Try, try to do it twice a day, but All right. All right. Um so what time what type of animals do you have and what are you utilizing them for? So right now we have uh, our dogs, of course. <laughs> we have chickens and I have a, a lion head bunny now that I just got a few weeks ago as well. Um, the chickens are for manure and for meat. Um, right now the flock that I have is a laying flock. However, um, I'm not afraid to dispatch one if I need to. Um, I, something I learned how to do a while back. Um, but. Uh, I do plan on getting about 30 meat chickens, uh, a chick order early in the spring and raising meat birds. Um, I am able to rent a plucker for $30 a day. So I'm excited to be able to do that and not have to buy one. That's fabulous. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to pasture raise some uh, poultry and do it organically too. Mm -hmm. um, and I may even offer some for sale. So we'll see. Um, may, uh, just worry about filling up my freezer and seeing how easy it is to work this. Um, I'm usually the one that's doing everything on the home set as far as the animals. So, and I do work part time, so it will, you know, it'd be challenging to see how this plays out for us. Um, but I just, I really want to fill my freezer <laughs> with some, with some, you know, local, uh, fresh, you know, something that I've raised, I've grown, I've known what's been fed into it and then let it feed me. There's nothing better than to open your freezer and to see that accomplishment. Right. After you've worked so hard to raise animals. So. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a conversation before about some of your meat handling practices and your smoking and curing. Can you share some of that with the audience? I bought him the smoker and he's utilized it quite a bit. Uh, he's now learning how to do uh, hams. He recently did one for New Year's that we did on New Year's Day. He smoked it on New Year's Eve. We ate it New Year's Day for, you know, tradition of the ham. 
Um, and uh, he does turkey breasts as well. He'll do turkey breasts and he'll throw them in the freezer for us to consume at a later time. But the whole curing of the, the raw, you know, pork to turn it into a ham was, was pretty awesome for him to do that. So I, I foresee him doing that quite a bit and even pulling us further away from um, what's at the grocery store. So tell me about the, like the aging process of the chickens that you just recently did. I know you, you just uh, dispatched a couple of chickens and yeah. I was asking you about the aging process prior to freezing or before right. utilizing. So tell me about that. Yeah, so I had read in one of my chicken keeping books that for older birds, that it's best to let them cure in the open air, you know, in the refrigerator for several days. It helps age them and can result in a more tender, moist, and juicier bird um, that, uh, you know, has just better overall quality um, because of the older birds being a little bit tougher um, and meant more or less, yes, for stewing and not roasting, but uh, that was just a something to try to see how it worked out. My birds were fantastic. Um, it tasted really great, but um, the dark meat, I was really surprised. I'm, I'm a huge dark meat fan, but with the dark meat of them being a little bit older birds and overworking those muscles a lot more than a typical you know, broiler that you get from the grocery store, I didn't care for the dark meat. I really liked the breast meat so much more. So that really surprised me. But so um, you, So, sorry, when you age them, so you, pluck them, you cut them up, and then what do you actually do? You just set them on a plate in the refrigerator, or how, what are you yes. doing with them to age them, and how long are you doing that for? Yeah, you can do that for three to five days. Yes, exactly that. Just you you prepare them, you put them open air into the refrigerator on a platter or a plate or some sort of tray, and let them stay in there for three to five days. And that, um, that they will... Um, become um, a much more yellowish on the on the skin as they dry out but as soon as you cook them they re-moisten back up so it, it kind of looks very strange and it's not very pretty to look at but the, I won't argue with the taste of it so I'm curious to see is how ones that when we pay our pasture poultry um, later this spring when we're just bagging them and freezing them in comparison to what these do. But I, I don't know that it's gonna be a fair comparison since those were older birds. So, yeah. and then you said the purpose of this now is to actually um, it not, so the meat won't be as tough, is that what it is? Yeah, so it lets it, it, it Let's it age so that everything is, um, I guess, more or less all the gases can be released um, from the muscles. And that it, it uh, I guess, allows for um, a more relaxing process, whether they just go from, you know, being bagged to freezing to where they stay stiff the entire time. So let me ask you a question about the, the curing that you guys do of the yeah. hams. So do you, do you, um, smoke any other meat besides like ham? Do you do fish or anything like that? I would love to try to do some salmon, but we, we don't live anywhere close by to where we can acquire fresh enough salmon to, I would want to put in a, a smoker. Um, but we have done cheeses before. We've cold okay. smoked cheeses. Um, that's really not, that's awesome. We did some smoked Gouda and that was, we love smoked Gouda as it is, but that was amazing. So like, how do you do it? You just go to the store and you buy Gouda or do you buy it locally or fresh or how do you do yeah. that? Yeah, you just buy wherever you can source the Gouda from and you actually will want to do it on a cold, um, colder day. So this time of year is perfect time to do it. And your temperature on your smoker, you want to set it as low as you can go. And then you actually can put ice inside of your smoker as well, trays of ice to keep it from overheating. And it just allows enough of the smoke to come through and circulate. And you don't do it for very long. I want to think it's only about 30 minutes to an hour or so that you do it. Okay, so if you bought a piece of meat, like pork, like a ham, that's mm -hmm. just been dispatched, never been cured or anything, mm -hmm. what would you do with that piece of meat to cure it and smoke it? Yeah. So smoking actually cures it, right? It's right, right. So, well, you do have to do a curing mix with it before you do the smoking. <clears throat> Excuse me. You want to put it, uh, mix a curing mix, and my husband used a wet brine, a uh, wet curing method this time, and he did it for 14 days. 
it sat in the refrigerator in the garage for 14 days and every day he'd go out there and shake it up a little bit just to make sure everything was good with it. <clears throat> and then after those 14 days, he took it out of the refrigerator, dried it off. <coughs> oh, excuse me. After those 14 days, he took it out of the dryer, dried it off, let it set to equalize. I'm so sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> he let it equalize for um, another week. And then he smoked in the smoker for about... Wait, what does that mean, equalize? So after you take it out of the brine for 14 days, then what what does that mean, equalize? So I guess that's more of the, more like the, the dry cure as well, like dry aging it a little bit. Um, I'm thinking to allow all the salts and everything to, you know, whatever's concentrated to kind of maybe... Um, flow throughout it a little bit to where it's not if there's one concentration in one area it may move to another area i'm and not sure he's a smoking expert <laughs> not me yeah okay and then does he just leave it in like in the garage in a dark area covered or something uh in the refrigerator in the garage yeah i gotcha okay yeah. and then how long then you put it in the smoker and how long does that process last usually um it takes pretty much all day so you know you can't go out and run and off it takes anywhere from 12 to 16 hours he likes to do it slower um at about 225 degrees um so is, then, that uh, a, is it preservation as well as taste or is it both it's it's both um, for, for, for us it's actually just for the taste right now um we could you know do it for preservation but we don't have the need it's not not to say that it's any different than meats that are cured in a smokehouse it could be you know um, I guess in the proper conditions, like a smokehouse would keep meat, it would also keep that way. But I think we really want to try and curing a country ham, the salt method, um, and see how that goes. We wanted to do one this year, but we just ran out of time for it. So that may be something that's on the Christmas plate next year. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about any of the other sustainable practices that you use on the homestead. Yeah, again, um, I've said that I've used compost. Of course, um, you know, we're, we're gardening organically to make sure that we're not further harming the earth. Um, we do recycle um, and we reuse a lot of things to repurpose things. Uh, I collect rainwater. Um, we uh, do grass mulching and we also, where we don't mow, we allow the field to grow the wildflowers and we have tons of black-eyed Susans that fill our field up in the back and it's just beautiful every spring um, and we let those go for the pollinators as well um, but just you know overall trying to be nicer to the to our land and you know not abuse it and you know leave it for worse for the next person to come along too that makes my heart smile <laughs> it does really it really does so we're getting ready to wrap up um, <clears throat> if you can sum up in one word what your homesteading experience has meant to you, what would that be? Um, they've been enlightening. Enlightening in many different ways of, of ways of educating others and educating myself. Um, I love to talk about all of this. So I'm either being enlightened or I'm enlightening someone else because, you know, I'm the crazy lady that likes to talk about a garden and her chickens all the time. So I'll bore you to death. <laughs> no, I think most of us homesteaders do. We love all of that. All of the above. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. I'm in Kelly. Good company. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Very My informational. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gloria. Uh-huh.